Good afternoon, good evening, and for some people, good morning. This is Amit from CFSO TV, and I very warmly welcome you all to this very exciting uh, fireside chat that we are doing on various industry topics. This time we are speaking about fintech, and I have got a very special guest with me, who is Mr. Sunil Rongola, uh, who is the Senior Vice President, Strategy, Innovations, and Analytics for Worldline India. Very warm welcome, Mr. Sunil. Thank you, Mr. Avant. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I would like to understand, um, uh, looking at the overall uh, startup scenario, uh, fintech is, of course, part of that startup ecosystem. So, how do you perceive the role of fintech innovations? Because fintech, um, it means if we see the last couple of years, fintech has been, fintech have been a very, uh, I mean, uh, means they have been, they have become a growth they have become a tech innovators, okay, for the BFSI sector. Okay, so according to you, how do you perceive fintech innovations are reshaping the BFSI sector for the future? So uh, I think the fintech environment and fintechs in general are extremely uh, good for the entire financial ecosystem per se. And the reason why I say that is uh, for the financial ecosystem to actually kind of grow, uh, you need to be, it needs to be very technology driven. Uh, yeah, and so the reality is that a lot of the fintechs, and I speak from experience having been part of fintech myself, is that fintechs are small, they're nimble, and as a result, very agile, uh, agile in terms of how they respond to certain market situations or uh, how they can. Uh, the reality is that it's not like, you know, the large companies are slow, but large companies have a lot more commitments. So the smaller smaller fintechs, whether it's a startup or whether they're you know two or three years old, but generally having you know a small workforce about fifty or so, a couple of things. One, what makes them kind of very agile is that there a lot of them are product focused. So there is a single or two products that they focus on, and they bring a lot of innovation to it, a lot of research to it. Uh, the second one is that uh, they, like I said before, they are agile, and so if there's any changes, they're able to react to those changes fairly quickly. So I think as a result of, you know, these, uh, there are many reasons why they're, you know, key to the ecosystem. But I think these two, because they bring this sort of innovation and they bring this sort of technology, this automation, everything to the financial sector, that it, 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 they become the sort of game changers. And as a result, a lot of times, uh, one of the reasons why you see, you know, the larger fintechs buying the smaller fintechs is for the technology, because they see how the technology that has been developed by these fintechs whether it is from an operational excellence or whether it is to grow their revenues uh, or it's something that, you know, you haven't seen in the market itself. Uh, so that's why, you know, there's, 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 that's why a lot of large companies also incubate uh, these fintechs because of the fact that you never know. I mean, there is always a failure rate of fintech, but, you know, once you hit that sort of diamond, that diamond is what really makes the difference. So I think it's very, uh, to, you know, for a long statement is that I think the fintech world is, sort of uh, is very key to growing the financial ecosystem, not just in India, but in every financial ecosystem. And I think that's why, you know, you see governments, um, where I am in Hyderabad, in Telangana, government has has a fintech uh, startup accelerator and, you know, other, I, I think I just read yesterday, the government of India is, is putting together something. So uh, I think everybody has understood why there should be an ecosystem of, of startup fintechs and uh, the smaller fintechs. Very good, very fair. Uh, so, what I also want to understand um, means if we talk about uh, major shifts in technology, okay, so what would be the, according to you, how do you perceive those major shifts that these fintech are bringing uh, in the BFSI sector that are basically rapidly transforming the traditional financial practices? So, what technologies are being pushed by these fintechs which are basically transforming the uh, traditional financial practice that has been sure. So I speak to it more from a payments perspective because that's the sector that I'm in and where you see a lot of dynamic fintechs uh, uh, present. And if you, so I got into the fintech space, uh, the, the payment space, digital payment space in 2009. And in 2009, it was your plain vanilla kind of system. So just in 14 years, uh, you know, the 2009 era is completely unrecognizable. 
uh, and uh, you can say that UPI has transformed uh, uh, payments, but UPI has been managed to a large extent by by uh, by NPCI and is largely driven by three large uh, companies. Uh, but the fintechs have played a much smaller role, and we kind of see it on a day to day basis because you see from, for example, in the in the space of uh, issuance, right? So. Uh, you have seen these companies issuing prepaid cards and sort of increasing credit uh, to a lot of other people. They were willing to uh, explore uh, within the boundaries that set by the Reserve Bank of India. They were willing to explore certain uh, measures of how to uh, how to uh, give credit. Uh, while uh, one of the amazing thing was, you know, some of these cards that you saw in the market without naming them, uh, they could do KYC in literally thirty seconds or one minute, and you were given a virtual card. And you could start spending. Uh, that was something very new. Then you had these innovations like uh, BNPL, uh, buy now, pay later. Uh, you are seeing a lot of how do you onboard merchants quickly. So those are also some of these fintechs. A lot of value-added services that are being provided to merchants. Uh, so in in a lot of spheres, you're seeing fintechs uh, reinventing how the market is. Sort of um, now, one of the big advantages of the fintech, like I said earlier, is that they have a product or two products that they can focus on and so they could really drill down on it and and make sure that you know uh, whatever product that they're coming out with is a well thought out and an exceptional uh, product so uh, you're seeing that and a lot of times you're seeing that in uh, the apps itself that you're seeing on a day-to-day basis whether it's uh, from, a, from a from a financial standpoint you're looking at how do you invest uh, and so across the board uh, I think you know uh, uh, fintechs, the small fintechs, and when I say fintechs, I'm talking about startups and the smaller fintechs are changing the game across the uh, the way we do business. Uh, and you know, the mobile revolution has been literally led by these uh, these fintechs. Very good, very fair. And uh, see, oh, what we are seeing that there are so many uh, so many players that we see in the digital payments space. Okay. So, if you talk about Worldline as, a, as an organization, so how does your platform differentiate itself from the competition in the digital payments landscape? And could you specify uh, uh, some specific features or innovation that set you for digital payment solutions apart from those? So, uh, Worldline, uh, so we are a large organization. So, we are not just present in India, we are present, uh, I mean, our headquarters is in France. So, we work very closely with our French uh, counterparts also. So, for example, uh, I'm part of what is called the Discovery Hub, and that's 40 of us globally to get together to understand what kind of solutions we can keep offering merchants. Because our focus at the end of the day is to understand how we provide value to the merchant. And by merchant, uh, I mean both online as well as uh, in store. Uh, yeah. And we are looking to see, uh, you know, the solution that we are offering is not just from a, give them a solution like a payment gateway or a or a, or a POS terminal, but to mm-hmm. see what else we can give them through the deliver to the to them through the POS terminal. So at the end of the day, we want to do you know merchant delight. So when when we when we give something to the merchant, uh, our our goal is to make sure how do we make the merchant's life easy. So to that end, we provide a whole host of value added services. We provide a lot of uh, you know reconciliation services mm-hmm. so that the merchant knows exactly what they're, where they're, uh, how much transactions they're doing, what kind of funds, uh, where the funds are, are being uh, settled to. Um, and so the list goes on and on. Um, and, you know, we, uh, I'm specifically working on a, on a platform where uh, we're looking to see how we can enhance the, the merchant's experience, uh, not just in terms of, uh, not just in terms of, you know, uh, giving them a payment solution but how do we make sure that payment solution also adds value to the merchant in terms of increasing revenues for them uh and so we constantly do that so and also in our in through our parent company there's something called worldline labs where mm-hmm. we are looking to see for example one of the things that we are experimenting is how do we pay uh through uh, with our vehicles uh how and how do we uh, uh get in the internet of things uh, so how do we pay through our fridges? How do we pay through through our speakers, home speakers? So and we constantly are, are looking to see what the payments of future is, what the future of payments is. And to that end, uh, uh, our research and development is all towards that. Very good. So uh, uh, I would also like to understand that uh, means 
um, in what ways uh, fintech solutions solutions from fintechs are enhancing the customer experience and personalizing the financial services in ways that were not possible before okay means if you talk about five five six years back okay so what are the new things what are the new customer experiences what are the new personalized ways of doing financial services which are happening now which were not possible uh, before and if you could uh, sh also share some instances wherein uh, wherein you could give a few references up about the technology so I think uh, one often used example of a fintech that's really gone big is uh, Zeroda in the in the stock market investing, and it has revolutionized stock market investing because it's put the power back with the uh, the buyer, with the yeah. with the investor. Uh, through there, uh, it's very simple to you know invest. Uh, it's non fussy, uh, and so if you if you compare uh, the, their investments uh, investments done through their platform versus other platforms. Uh, there's is a lot more easier to do. So I think some of the fintechs, what they are doing in terms of, uh, they're removing the sort of pain points, they're removing the friction points, sorry. Uh, and so I think that's what they're really innovating in. Uh, so see, because at the end of the day, if you look at payments, right, the payments is only the channel changes. So at the end of the day, you, you have a merchant, you have a buyer, but in the beginning, in the middle, is whether it's a UPI, I mean, it was checks before, it was cash before, then it went, came to credit cards, you have prepaid cards, now it's a UPI. So something will be there later, we don't know. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the ecosystem kind of remains the same. It's just that how do you improve the sort of efficiency of the ecosystem? So uh, I think where the fintechs have, have really excelled at uh, is, is uh, so I we work with a number of companies and you just saw that uh, GFF that was happening there, right? So the Global FinTech Fest. So there also, um, they, they, the, the, it was amazing how quickly you can do KYC, how quickly you can open bank accounts. Uh, in, in, in previous yes years to open a bank account, it took forever. Uh, now you can do it in literally minutes, one or two minutes. You, you, could, you can do this. The other sort of way that fintechs have sort of revolutionized this is that offering, for example, like give me an excellent example is offering credit, working capital to merchants. Uh, till now, you know, a few years back, if, if a merchant wants working capital, they have to go to their bank, fill up loans, they have to give something in return. I mean, they have to give collateral, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this happens. Uh, now uh, there are, there are fintechs that will actually give you a loan within minutes, uh, and unsecured loans, not secured loans. Uh, unsecured loans within minutes because they have they've come up with certain algorithms to do the KYC. They've come with certain algorithms to assess the risk of the merchant, and so they're able to give uh, a loan to the merchant fairly quickly. So you have these sort of and and, and it's not the banks that are doing it; it's actually these fintechs uh, that are doing this. So I think these are some of the ways that you're seeing, you know, how personalized kind of experiences are happening where. And one of the changes that the fintechs have bought in is the sort of immediacy. Uh, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, they don't have to really, uh, they've changed the sort of game in terms of, uh, instead of having to wait for days or weeks, it's in minutes now. And I think that's the real change that they've bought in. So an efficiency to the system is something that they have really uh, fast forwarded the system. Very good, very good. So you already talked about uh, operational efficiencies. Okay, so uh, can you also let me understand? Is, is has there been some cost reductions as well? Because uh, uh, I mean, generally operational efficiencies are is cost reductions. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. reduction in cost. So can yeah. you give me some examples wherein we have actually reduced the expenses we make on financial transactions? So uh, I think see because the cost of financial transactions always reduces at scale. And so right now, if you look at, and I'll take the example of UPI, right? So UPI, and I was just looking at the numbers recently, they just hit uh, 10 billion transactions a month. So, and compared to what you had before. So in that sort of operational efficiency is with the scale that you, you, you're you getting in, and I'm not talking about UPI, I'm just talking about general financial, digital finance um, kind of uh, situation, uh, payments also. You are seeing a lot of scale that's happening. Uh, but to that end also, you are seeing, uh, I mean, and let's, uh, we have to talk about this because, for example, you're seeing generative AI. Uh, and generative AI is now being used uh, to sort of provide solutions without humans. 
uh, you're seeing a lot of chatbots itself. I mean, chatbots have been there for a long time, but the chatbots have become very intelligent. I mean, they are able to solve problems so fast, uh, whether, you know, if you order something and, uh, I mean, these days, uh, if I'm on an app and uh, something has happened and I click on the chatbot function, it's almost always a AI chatbot. So there is uh, cost savings also being that, that done that way. And for a long time, you know, you've seen how uh, the cost saving has less to do with people, but more to do with time. Uh, I think when you're looking at a lot of companies, they're not looking to fire people wholesale. What they're trying to do is, if a, so for example, if you look at robotic process automation, right, or processes, uh, the objective of robotic process automation is, to, is not necessary to eliminate people, but how do you how do you automate a process that took, let's say, two hours to two minutes without with with almost no uh, errors, uh, removing all kind of human errors from it. So you are seeing that kind of thing too. So you indeed a lot of the automation that you're seeing these days revolves around. So even if you're looking at, for example, KYC, right? A lot of the K before KYC documents meant somebody was checking through the papers, everything. Now you are literally connected to APIs. So there are companies that have developed. You just take a photo of the PAN card, and there or you enter your you're able, you're able to pull out everything and digitally verify everything. So it saves a lot of cost. It saves a lot of time. So, and when you're looking at, um, uh, like I said, these loans thing also, you're saving up a lot of costs uh, there too. So a lot of, see, at the end of the day, uh, for a company to, and especially for fintechs, and this is critical because uh, you may know about some of the, uh, the, the losses in the fintech system. Uh, that it is necessary that, you know, they cut costs because uh, they also need to make profits uh, for uh, funding or any such activity. So it is it is critical that, I mean, will they make uh, profits in the first year? Very unlikely. But if they, if they understand how to manage their costs, uh, especially on the technology side with a lot of automation, then uh, things get much better. Very well. Very well. So, uh, means... We are also hearing much about blockchain as a technology and people are talking about blockchain has got a very bright future if we talk about BFSI as an industry. So have you seen any, any, that means any lifetime or any, or any, uh, any current application that you are seeing around blockchain technology into security or maybe transparency or efficiency in financial tech transactions? So, uh, so if you could share some real world examples where in blockchain yeah. so i mean see uh, the uh, we've heard of blockchain now for the past few years but yeah. the reality is that probably blockchain was a bit uh, ahead of its time uh, not to not to take any away from anything away from the the fantastic technology that blockchain actually yeah. is so uh, the reality now is that you know most people associate blockchain with uh, cryptocurrencies uh, whether you're talking about Bitcoin or Ether or any of these cryptocurrencies, they were all built on the blockchain. Uh, with the the reason for that blockchain was that there was supposed to be accountability, uh, there was supposed to be security. They, they, I mean, technically nobody could steal, but the reality was that there were there were indeed a lot of uh, crypto coins that were that were hacked, and if you had the keys, you could actually take it. But nevertheless, uh, that was a few and far between thing. Uh, I think you are seeing smaller use cases of blockchain in terms of land uh, registry. Uh, I think some states in India are also using blockchain for land registry. And the, the because of the fact that, you know, blockchain is immutable, you can't change it. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, it provides a great deal of security to this. And now you're seeing the, the bigger use case for blockchains around the world is the central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. And you see, you've seen the EUP, which the RBI has uh, has has released a few months back. Uh, also sitting on the blockchain, and and the primary reason for the blockchain is given the security of the blockchain and the immutability of the uh, of of the blockchain. So I think you know you'll keep seeing use cases as you go because right now what you hear about and the loud noise about blockchain is around uh, is around currencies, whether it's crypto or CBDCs. But I think, you know, you'll see a lot more of blockchain uh, when it comes to record keeping, uh, when it comes to uh, sort of security. Uh, and so you'll see that that uh, continuously coming into play. Very good. 
So uh, now coming to the another technology which was which has been very uh, relevant today. Um, it has been in the talks for for a long time, but uh, with generative AI and various other AI driven solutions. So how exactly are these AI based solutions are actually helping customer interactions, financial decision making, or uh, maybe uh, making uh, the financial transactions more efficient and more customer friendly. Sure. So I don't think generative AI and we're all, I think you're referring to chat GPT uh, is not really doing anything as far as making financial transactions more efficient. But in terms of uh, right now, um, uh, you know, there is a lot of promise behind the technology. So a lot of, I think a lot of um, uh, chatbots are now being from a real world use case a lot of chatbots are actually being equipped with chat gpt so if you just go to bing their their uh, the microsoft uh, explorer the microsoft uh, internet browser uh, you have you have the chat gpt because microsoft funded uh, chat gpt so you have the generative ai there and it's very interesting as to because i've typed out certain questions and it it's very interesting how it pulls out the data but i still think that you know uh, there's a lot higher i mean a lot more road to it because uh there is it's not all sunshine as far as chat gpt is concerned so for example uh there was this case in the us where uh a lawyer tried to get precedence for uh for uh certain uh for for a case that he was working on and it was regarding an airline and chat gpt gave him three precedents and uh, it turned out chat gpt made up all three precedent uh, all three precedents and in fact, he presented these precedents in the court and the opposition lawyers found out that they tried to search for these these cases and they couldn't find them. And at that point, uh, uh, he admitted that thing. So you have those extreme cases also. Uh, but this was an actual real life thing. This was in a U.S. court uh, and I think it was a U.S. federal court. Uh, so you are having those, those circumstances also. Uh, but on the whole, I think right now, as you see it, uh, I was watching an uh, an interview between uh, Bill Gates and uh, and Sal Khan, who uh, who is the founder of uh, uh, educational online educational foundation called the Khan Academy, and yeah. he was talking about uh, they were testing. Bill Gates had asked him to test out uh, uh, on uh, their uh, their version of high school exam uh, for biology or mathematics, uh, and Sal Khan was basically saying that how. In, in two weeks or so, uh, Chat GPT was able to give answers for all questions. Uh, yeah. I think it was a bi I'm, I'm missing what subject it was. I think it was biology or something else. But yeah, and it's called bio AP, the Advanced Placement Test. And uh, uh, it, it's able to uh, get so much information from the internet, but more importantly, not just getting the information, it's able to sort of uh, coagulate it and present it in a cohesive manner. And I think that's what is sort of a game changing kind of thing. And, you are now, I mean, I was just reading a story uh, just a few days back in the New York Times about uh, uh, college admissions and the essays. Mm -hmm. And Chad GPT was writing better essays than people uh, for college admissions. So if you are having all these interesting use cases. I'm sure, you know, colleges are going to come back. And I, and I already know that there is some sort of engine or some sort of uh, uh, software that will detect whether it was written by an AI bot or whether it was written by a human. Uh, yeah. so you, you have a lot of, uh, interesting, uh, I mean, use cases, but I think the future is still, I mean, it's, it's, it's still, uh, a, not a while away, but it, it's going to take some time before, uh, you see the full impact of generative API, what you are generative, uh, AI, what you're seeing now are a little bit more of the gimmicky kind of stuff, but yeah. the huge real world applications, I think you're going to see coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, uh, my next question is, how do you envision the impact of decentralized finance on the traditional financial services sector? So, decentralized finance is, is uh, you know, the blockchains of the sort of the uh, cryptocurrencies and those sort of uh, things. So, uh, are you saying, uh, are you asking for how it's going to impact the financial sector or? Yeah. I mean, uh, so I, mean, I think oh, okay, oh, I, oh, let me let me answer that. And I've actually done a research paper on this. Uh, it it 
because uh, in terms of decentralized finance cryptocurrencies, and let's take India out of the picture because most uh, we don't have much cryptocurrencies in India, uh, like Bitcoin and all that. But other uh, other economies where you have this, uh, it doesn't seem to be. I mean, at, at some point, you know, there was a lot of uh, paper written about how decentralized finance will actually take over and change the way that we do finance and a lot of uh, the large, uh, as for example, JP Morgan and all, uh, uh, invested into uh, DeFi and a lot of other big finance because a lot of they expected that you know DeFi would change the way that things would be done. But then you've seen uh, what has happened with the the, the cryptocurrencies, etc. Is that they become a speculative instrument and less a sort of uh, instrument of change. Uh, because uh, when Bitcoin was founded, the the objective, as they said, it was to get away from the government rule and we have a currency of our own and everything. But at the end of the day, now anybody you ask anybody about Bitcoin, the and it's all about perception matters. And uh, Bitcoin is all about uh, uh, to speculation. Uh, and you've seen this with the fall of this uh, the Sam Bank the Sam Bankman Fried. Uh, and uh, his uh, his exchange, uh, and so and right now you're also seeing uh, crypto and DeFi in a bit of a low because uh, they're actually I think still trying to reinvent the model here because they need to take it away from a see because at the end of the day as I look at it why is why is a currency accepted and a, cu a currency is accepted because there is uh, if I give you ten rupees you will accept it without even thinking because you know it's backed by the government. There is a legal tender to it, and any and for a currency to succeed, the the person has to accept your money. Uh, in the case of a Bitcoin or so, uh, the uh, we there is a website actually which shows how many bit how many merchants accept accept Bitcoin. And uh, a colleague of mine in in, Bar in Barcelona and I were doing a paper on this, and we were looking at this website, and I think it was one forty stores in Paris. Uh, some few stores in Delhi. I don't know how true that was. That's according to the website. And so you're seeing only hundreds and hundreds of stores in a large city. You're not even thing. So without, so you need. They need to change the model from, you know, being on an exchange and being a thing, to something where it actually becomes a, 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 a currency for transactions for goods and services. That leap is yet to be made, uh, in a in a in a substantial way. So until that happens, you're not really uh, going to see that. See, because there've been DeFi's that have been uh, based on uh, what do you call that? On uh, on uh, uh, backed by currency or gold or anything like that. But still, there have been failures across the board there. Okay, very good. So um, now let's talk about uh, no code and low code platforms. So we are we are seeing uh, that. Many of the vendors are actually very gung ho about uh, no code and low code platforms. So, how exactly are they benefiting the overall fintech innovations by enabling rapid development and development of solutions? Okay, so uh, how is it impacting the fintech uh, landscape? And uh, could also provide some instances where these uh, platforms have actually expedited the creation of fintech sure. solution for fintech products. So uh, I, let me be upfront and tell you, I'm not a technology person. I'm more in the uh, products and strategy. But I know a little bit about low code and uh, no code, and how the prevalence of you know low code and no code has really has, gro has grown. The thing, one of the things that it really does is that it makes it very uh, easy to integrate with uh, other systems. Uh, because see, at the at this in this age, uh, what happens is that you can't just have a system, a platform standing by itself. Uh, a platform becomes useful once it's linked to multiple platforms, so it becomes a hub, or uh, it's it's easy. So the one of the one of the the real strengths of these no code platforms or low code platforms is their ease of integration with other platforms, and I think that is that's what really because th 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 that's what is their value add uh, they bring to this. Very good. So uh, uh, my last question would be that uh, as a leader. Uh, in the fintech space, how do you anticipate the future trajectory of the BFSI sector considering the ongoing technology-driven changes? Sure. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, it, the reason, I mean, it, 
that it's bright is is without question and i think there are several reasons for it one you have very active government support for it uh the government certainly wants to make uh, the bfsi sector into a into a very tech driven sector make it more efficient and make it all more per- pervasive the other thing is that you have a a, re- a regulator in the form of the reserve bank of india and the reserve bank uh, has the dual duty of obviously protecting the system while also growing, growing it and so the way that you know we've been seeing certain mandates by the reserve bank uh is is certainly uh um I, you know certainly in the st- in the in the direction of making sure that this 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 bfsi sector the payment sector keeps growing the other thing is that there has been a shift to uh more of profits you know because at the end of the day unless you generate some amount of profits uh these companies will cease to exist in a few years because if you're not if you're not making profits it means you have to be funded and uh, there is a general funding winter currently happening in the bfsi space uh, that is not a secret it's known to everyone so you are going to see a lot more a uh, lot more sort of uh, changes in the way that companies do business in the sense that a lot more innovation is going to come out so that because at the end of the day it's that innovation that value add that you give a customer is why they're willing to pay for certain products and and i think there's going to be a a market shift towards uh uh towards uh you know profitability there is going to be a market shift towards providing consumers that sort of uh that extra kind of user experience uh because we all know how we felt when we made that first upi transaction uh yeah. you know we could I, and i was in the payment sector for many years when i made the first upi transaction and i could not believe that the transaction had been completed so those sort of user experiences i think we're going to keep seeing more and more of it and more at the merchant side more at the the consumer side uh and more at the consumer side when i mean not just for the payment space but for the general bfsi kind of sector mm-hmm. uh and i think that is what is going to keep drive because the way you get people involved in this uh is you make it easy for them to use the more onerous uh you make it for someone to use uh and that's what i think is really driving you know change in in the current financial sector is that everything is becoming easier to use from your kyc to your application to sub- submitting documents and i think that is really and people at the moment you see people seeing the use case of hey i can do this in you know in 5 minutes as opposed to 1 hour you're immediately going to take uh, you're immediately going to change your method and you're not only going to change your method you're going to tell 5 to another people so you're going to have this network effect that keeps happening and you know like compound interest this this is going to just keep increasing uh, further and further and and it's borne out in numbers itself the way that you know you're seeing digital payments grow you're seeing how uh, people are investing in the stock market uh, and they all want you know platform they all want to use platforms that you know make their life easier they don't want to go through Sir. you know onerous uh, requirements etc so i think the future is very bright for india uh, for a lot of reasons uh and i think it's going to be driven heavily i mean for, to your first question it's going to be driven heavily by fintechs very good so uh, very very truly said uh when fintech are going are going to drive are actually right now driving the overall fintech overall bfsi segment plus they they are going to drive in future as well that's a, that's a true thing because technology would be a very engrossed part of the any business that Uh, that would grow in future so thanks a lot thanks a lot for your time thank you my pleasure you have provided, you have, you have provided very in depth uh, very in depth uh, insights to the questions and which are very relevant to the audience thanks a lot for it thank you my pleasure for more updates from cxo tv please like and subscribe to our channel